renewed or restored to God's original design for us. Now I want you to just take a step back and think about that with me this morning. To be redeemed means to be bought back by God. It means to be uh, renewed or restored back to what God made me to be. And we were talking about what God made us to be last week. We learned about that in the Garden of Eden. We learned about how God made us. We learned how to, about how sin changed us. And we learned about how Jesus, through Jesus, we can be redeemed. We can become renewed. God's original design for humanity is to rule God's good world and to sum up the world's praises back to God. That's really what we were describing as our vocation. That's what we're supposed to be about and doing in this world. And this morning, you'll notice that I've included for you a couple of illustrations from the New Testament that say this in, in just slightly different ways. Peter, as it's recorded in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, says, talking to the believers, he says, But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of Him who called you out of darkness into His light. There's that, that summing up of the praises part, isn't it? So we are to be a royal priesthood. And then Paul says it in a slightly different way, but it's really essentially the same thing. He says in this beautiful passage found in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 20, We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making His appeal through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. What Paul is saying is, as an ambassador, as, a, as one in the royal priesthood, we have been called to carry the message of our king out into the world. He works through us. That's what he's called us to be about. So this morning, this, we're going to be just kind of beginning to talk about how that works in practical terms by asking the question after we've kind of been hopefully some of the some of these thoughts that I'm sharing with you are, are maybe some questions are emerging and hopefully one that will emerge well how do how do I do that how how do I live out this vocation if I accept the fact that as a follower of Jesus as one who has been redeemed that I have the vocation of being an ambassador of being within the royal priesthood how do I do that what does that look like that's really what this message is about. And so, uh, let's dig into it together. Uh, first of all, let me say to you that I believe that Jesus, Jesus himself, taught kingdom people, that's who we are, that kingdom people must strive to be perfect. Kingdom people must strive to be perfect. In, at at a, a critical junction in one of Jesus' most famous teachings called the Sermon on the Mount, which is found in Matthew chapter 5 through chapter 7. At the end of chapter 5, after having given the Beatitudes and after having given some, some key teaching and clarification uh, of what it means to live in the kingdom, he makes uh, this statement in verse 48. He says, Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Now, I suspect you've heard that passage before. But I suspect also that probably while you're uh, listening to this message right now, you're probably thinking, did he say perfect? Did he say that God's standard? Did he say that God called me to be perfect? Is, is my internet buffering funny or something? Or did he really say that? Really? Perfect? Well, if that sounds weird to your ear as a follower of Jesus, there's a reason why. The reason that sounds so weird to us is because our understanding of the word perfect is one that we have embraced from our culture. You see, the word perfect as we understand it currently today means to be without error. It means to not have any mistakes, to be mistake free, to be flawless. So if there's any kind of a mistake or error or anything like that, we say it's not perfect. Only perfect happens when all of those things have been eliminated. 
And unfortunately, many Christians have embraced this definition of perfect, which is unfortunate because it really uh, obscures what the Scripture is really talking about, and it creates kind of a, a dualism of thought within us which is difficult to reconcile. Now, I suggest to you, let me suggest to you that many of us as followers of Jesus have embraced that definition. And the reason it's causing us so much trouble right now is because there's also another thought that is probably kicking around in your mind right now. Let me see if it is, okay? Let me suggest it. How many of you have heard this phrase? Nobody's perfect. perfect. Right. See, that's what we think. And that's what we hear. And that's reflective of what I'm talking about, that we've embraced this idea that the word perfect means sinless, without error, all of those sorts of things. And let me suggest to you that if your definition, as you read the scripture, when you come across the word perfect is, 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 being, uh, is hearing that playing of that nobody's perfect, nobody's perfect, nobody's perfect in the back of your mind. And then you come across passages like this where Jesus says, be perfect therefore as your Father in heaven is perfect. And we're going to look at some others. That's not the only time we've been called to be perfect. I, I don't know what you do with that. I don't, I don't, I'm not sure what we do with that. It seems like God is saying one thing and he's, he's saying something else. We're told we're all sinners, but we're told to be perfect. How, how, do you, how do you balance that? How does that make sense? Is he exaggerating? Is he using hyperbole? Is he just holding up some kind of impossible standard to just show us how big of a mess we really are? Or maybe there's something else going on. Let me suggest to you that something else is going on. Uh, look on then. In the first century, in the worst, in the first, in the worst, in the first century, not the worst century, but the first century, the word perfect, the word perfect meant, write this down, complete or mature, having reached the goal. Complete or or mature, having reached the goal. And you'll notice in your outline, I've included a word that starts with T, with T teleos, teleos. Or in some, uh, it's, it's a Greek word, which is the word that's being translated perfect into the English language. In some of the passages of Scripture, it's the word telos, which is kind of the difference between the word perfect and the word perfection. That kind of explains the variation. So what Jesus is really saying in Matthew chapter 5, 48, is this. He's saying, at, at kind of, again, kind of the, the culmination of some, of some teaching about what it means to be kingdom of God people. He's saying, be people of the goal. Be complete people. Be genuine in your humanity. Be truly the people God created you to be. Having become complete people. Mature. Mature. Having reached the goal. Let's see if that works. Let's go on and let's look at a couple of other passages. One of the most famous passages in the New Testament is an encounter that took place between Jesus and a man referred to as the rich young ruler. And in Matthew chapter 19, we have part of this, this story uh, included in Matthew's gospel. And uh, it starts out like this. Matthew chapter 19 verse 16 says, Just then a man came up to Jesus and asked, Teacher, what good thing must I do to get eternal life? What good thing must I do to get eternal life? Now, you'll notice in verse 20, we actually get Jesus' response. Jesus says to him in response to all the things that he's done, he says, the young man says, all these I have kept, the young man said, what do I still lack? Look at what Jesus says, verse 21. Jesus answered, if you want to be perfect, teleos, if you want to be perfect, go sell your possessions and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. What Jesus was saying to him, you have some things that are lacking. He says, to be complete, if you want to be complete, if you want to be perfect, if you want to be teleos, then you will do these things, which will enable you then to be a follower of Jesus. 
Because we know, you know what happened to the rich young ruler. He was not able to follow Jesus because he considered how rich he was. You see, his riches were the impediment to him being a follower of Jesus. He was not complete. And he needed to deal with that. Let's look at another example. In James' le James letter to the church, in James chapter 3, verse 2, we come to another and very interesting passage, which almost seems to be saying two separate things, if we're not careful. Notice what he says at the beginning of James chapter 3, verse 2. We all stumble in many ways. Okay, so we're all stumblers, right? That's who we are. Anyone who is never at fault in what they say is perfect. Able to keep their whole body in check. That's interesting. That's interesting. What, again, what that means is that the, the person and what we read so many times in other places throughout the scripture, how, how our tongues are connected to our hearts, which reflect what's going on in our hearts. That's why James is saying what comes out of your mouth is, is associated with your heart. And if you don't have that under control, then all of these other aspects are not going to be under control either. So hopefully what you can see from this is, first of all, that, that uh, the idea of being perfect is not, when we say that, that God wants us to be perfect, it doesn't mean that he's saying that we will never sin. It doesn't mean that we will never make a mistake. That's not what he's saying. What he's saying is, I want you to strive towards being complete. I want you to be mature. And I want you to do the things necessary in order for you to do that. And so, uh, what are some of those things? Well, if, we'll get to that in just a second. Uh, let me suggest, if, if you're following the outline, turn that over. Christ followers then need to become reoriented, reoriented to the new reality that being redeemed brings. Being redeemed means that things are different. Things are different. Uh, being from Kansas... One of the things that uh, people always wonder about uh, since when they encounter you and they find out you're from Kansas is they, they always have to pull out some reference to the Wizard of Oz, right? You know, do you know Dorothy? You know, have you ever seen a flying monkey? You know, stuff like that. And, uh, you know, we all just kind of <laughs> chuckle along and, and, uh, and move on. Anyway... It, uh, but if you're familiar with that movie, and I don't know how you could be alive and not familiar with the movie, which is why I'm talking to you about it. But in the movie, right after the, you know, the big scene at the beginning where the house, there's the tornado, and, and they end up in Oz, right? And, and one of the, the cinematic amazing things that took place when that movie came out was that this was one of the very first movies that ever used uh, uh, color in the movie. The movie started out in black and white. And then when they entered the land of Oz, it, trans it transferred into color. And one of the very first things that Dorothy, as she begins to look around and explore what's going on in this crazy new world, and she's starting to see all kinds of weird things, she looks to her dog Toto and says that famous line, Toto, I don't think we're in Kansas anymore. Yeah, definitely not. And I, you, I share that with you because I think as followers of Jesus, part of what it means to be redeemed is that we need to be reoriented. We are not living as fallen people anymore. We are living as redeemed people. Over and over in the church, we hear this. And if you can, can start to embrace that, that understanding that I'm sharing with you about perfection, about being mature, about being complete, then other passages of Scripture in the New Testament start to take on a whole new meaning. For example, Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2 says, Listen, listen for it. Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy... To offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God, this is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Here it is. Then 
you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. You'll be able to know that and experience that. Look on John 15, 19. Jesus said, if you belong to the world, it would love you as its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, and that is why the world hates you. We live a different orientation, a different life. We are different people, and so our outlook and our approach to life needs to be different. Which brings us to Ephesians chapter 4, which is a classic teaching of the Apostle Paul with respect to the church. He says this, So Christ himself gave apostles and pro the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and teachers. Why? To equip his people for works of service, so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith, and in the knowledge of the Son of God, and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. What this whole measure, whole measure of the fullness of Christ, what is that talking about? What do we mean by that? Well, one of the things that, a phrase that you've heard me say every once in a while, is the phrase, fully formed followers of Jesus. Fully formed followers of Jesus. That's what I'm talking about. People who are complete, people who are mature. The church taught and even exists today to assist us all to reach this perfection, this completeness. And what is the goal? What is that? What does it look like? What does it look like? Well, we're going to start to, uh, to just catch a glimpse of that this morning, and then we're going to continue on with this next week. But let's, let's get that glimpse. Let's, let's get a, a brief picture of it this morning. Uh, the last, last point then, the teleos, or goal, is to embody Romans 12, 1 through 2, in order that we can function as, write this down, ambassadors. Or, if we were talking to Peter, as the royal priesthood. Essentially the same thing. How do, we, how do we do that? How do we go from uh, being one who is incomplete to one who is able to, to do this? And I chose that first passage that I referenced a little bit earlier uh, in the message, Romans chapter 12, verse 2, because it is so beautiful in how Paul develops this thought. I mean, he is brilliant here. And this, this particular passage gives us some critical clues into what we are to do, how we can do it, and what it looks like. What to do, how we do it, and what it looks like. What are we to do? Well, notice what he says. Do not be conformed, but instead be transformed. With respect to this world, we are to resist becoming like it and persist in uh, moving more towards what God is shaping us through his word. His Word, His Spirit, is striving and leading us to the place where we will be different people. We need to resist the temptation to be conformed to this world and persist in the, the goal that He's called us to be about, to, to persist in His Word, in His ways. So do not be conformed to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of our minds. How do we mature? How do we mature? By cooperating with God's design to transform us, renewing our minds. Just like we're, that's, that's part of what we're doing right now. Part of what I'm doing right now is, is taking passages of Scripture, which I know you are very familiar with, and, and just, just focusing on them in a, in a way that hopefully will, will make you or help you to uh, see the connection so that the Scriptures all do fit together. As we cooperate with God's design to transform us, one of the things that, that we have to come to terms with are the presence of God's Word and the presence of His Spirit in our daily lives. Brothers and sisters, I know too many people who are trying to follow Jesus without the Holy Spirit. 
I know too many followers of Jesus who are trying to, to follow him without his word. And the only thing that that's going to do is to leave you frustrated and conformed to this world. Which is precisely what we've been told not to do. We need to be transformed by the renewing of our minds. Now next Sunday, I am really excited to talk with you about how that works. We're going to consider a couple of models that oftentimes we hear about in the church and we're going to compare and contrast and see some things. I'm, I'm really excited about, about sharing with you next week. But what does it look like? What, what are we to do? We're not to be conformed, but rather be transformed. How do we mature? By cooperating with God's design to transform us, which we'll look into next week. What does teleos, what does it look like? Here it is. Look at what he says at the end of, of uh, uh, verse 2. You will be able to test and approve what God's will is, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. Now, wouldn't that be a nice skill to have? Wouldn't it be nice if on any and every occasion of life you were able, because of, of what God has done to reorient you, to transform you by the renewing of your mind so that you will be able to know what God's will is. You will be able to know uh, consistently that you are walking in His way that you are, and, and you are doing it with confidence, you're doing it with grace, you're able to do it with love, and all of the things that we talk about in church, you're able to do that. That is what teleos, that is what perfection looks like. Pleasing to God, perfect. Now, there is so much more that we could say about this, but I hope you can see the, the sketch. You can see how it begins to, to, uh, to unfold within our lives. What we have to come to terms with is oftentimes our, I'll just say it, stubbornness. Sometimes followers of Jesus can be stubborn, and the church said, Amen. Even the, the six that are here this morning, you know. Yeah, sometimes we're just stubborn. And we find all kinds of reasons why we don't uh, integrate, find ways to integrate God's Word into our lives. We don't spend time listening for His Spirit or seeking His Spirit. And these are grave mistakes, folks. I hope you're starting to get the idea that from the time that you decide to become a follower of Jesus, become a redeemed person, until the time either He comes back or you die, that you're not just to sit back and do nothing, or sit back and even just try to be a nice person. God's called you and me to be ambassadors. He's called us to be a royal priesthood. we got a job to do. And we'll never be able to do that vocation until we learn how to do it His way. And so I want to encourage you in that. And that's really where the focus of this teaching is going. So that leaves us with a couple of takeaways. First of all, Christ followers were redeemed. The reason you were redeemed is yes, to forgive your sins, yes, to provide you with an eternal home, but in the meantime, from the time that that happens until the time that the other happens, God has called you to be an ambassador, a royal priest within that royal priesthood. And part of what the church has been called to do is to help each and every one of us as individuals sort out where we fit into that so that we can best work together and accomplish the greatest good for the king. That's why we're here. That's why we're here. Secondly, then, a second key takeaway is that, that Christ followers need help to enable them to f become fully formed followers of Christ. We need help. You need help. I need help. We all need help in doing that. And that's why, as Paul reminds us, we have pastors and teachers and apostles and, and, and all of these sorts of people to enable us to do that. But, brothers and sisters, we can't do that if you're not willing. And part of, part of being willing is to revisit issues like we're talking about today, this whole idea of being perfect. I really hope you'll take this to heart. Because God has called us to be mature and complete people. Will we, will we not make mistakes? No, you're going to make mistakes. But He's given us provision to faithfully walk in Him, as we learned about last Wednesday night in 1 John, through confession, to stay whole and pure 
in Him. This is something bigger, friends. This is something bigger. This is something amazing. So, as I close this morning, I want to say one other thing that, uh, especially for people who are watching today who are not followers of Jesus, if you are not a follower of Jesus, this message so far doesn't really say a whole lot to you. Because this message is really for the body of Christ. Those of us who have been redeemed. That's all the condition, being redeemed. But, if you are not a Christ follower, what you can do is, just like all of us have done, is come to terms with the issue of who is the Lord? Who is the ruler of this world? Is it the powers of this world? Is it yourself? Or is it Jesus? And what all followers of Jesus have said, in one form or fashion, what we've all said, is that we believe that Jesus is the Lord. We believe that He is the Christ. We believe that He is God's Messiah, the Anointed One. And we, as we say that we believe that, we also submit to the reality that those who believe that He is Lord will submit themselves to Him. Why? Because He is Lord. He's the one in charge. So, if you're not a follower of Jesus today, this is what really being a follower of Jesus is about. And, and then, of course, learning how to live life as a redeemed person. How long is it going to take for you to figure it out? Well, I'm still working on it, and I've been doing it since I was about 12 years old, when I made my decision to follow Jesus. So, that's a long time. But, I can tell you this that along that journey God has brought me through some really cool things and he's helped me to become more of a complete person so now that that goal of being able to know what God's will and being able to to make good decisions and so forth uh, I don't always make great decisions but I do make some good decisions for the king and you can too in your personal life in your prayer life in your serving life in your giving life, in your work life, oh, in every aspect of your life. So, the bottom line, if you're not a follower of Jesus, I'm so glad you're listening today, because if there is one thing that God wants more than anything else in the world, He wants you to be in His family. He wants you to become an ambassador. He wants you to be a, a, in the royal priesthood. He wants to make you His son or daughter. He wants to make you His an heir to the king. That's what he wants to do for you. And so I'm glad you're listening today. And if you don't know how to become a follower of Jesus, please reach out here at the church and would love to share that with you because uh, uh, that's something you could do. Get started. Become a part of the redeemed. But it all comes back, brothers and sisters, to accepting the fact that being redeemed means that God has, has set in place this transformation process that He envisions for us in the church and to go out into the entire world. He wants us to change the world. And He's given the church that responsibility, you and me, to do that. And He's equipping us in local churches and in Bible colleges in so many different ways to be able to do that. And so we need to cooperate with that. And let God work well within us to perfect us. To perfect us. Let's pray together. Dear Father, I'm 